So now that you know just a little bit about the landscape we'll be discussing, let's start to dive in more to the first topic, which is parallel streams. And what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about the aggregate operations and functional programming features that Java 8 provides in its parallel streams framework. And I think this is a pretty cool example of parallel streams. It's got many streams. We'll also talk about how a parallel stream works at a high level. We'll talk in more detail later, maybe next time, about the internals of parallel streams, because it's worth knowing how they work, because it's cool, and because it helps to make you write better programs. All right, so what does a Java parallel stream do? It basically automatically splits its elements into multiple chunks using a splitterator, and then it uses a thread pool, the fork join pool, the common fork join pool, to process these chunks independently. In other words, they run on different cores. And you can take a look at some good documentation that's available at the Oracle website, which will give you other perspectives on this in a more textural way. The splitting of the original stream up into substream chunks and the thread pool that's provided are often invisible to programmers. You can take some control over it, but for the most part, it's like a a ninja. You don't really know it's there. The order in which the stream processes the chunks that are broken up are likely to be non-deterministic. And, and if you just think about what's going on, we'll talk about some more detail later, but if you think about what's going on, the splitterator is going to break up your input into chunks. Those chunks are going to be thrown into the common fork join pool decks, and then the threads in the common fork join pool will pull the chunks off of their queues, and they'll run in parallel. And it's really up to the framework to figure out how those things run, what order they run in. And of course, the goal is always to maximize throughput. So you don't really have much control over the way in which things run. And that's actually by design. You don't want control over this. You want the framework to figure out how to roll the dice in order to be able to get the maximal performance. So non-determinism in this case is usually a good thing. It sometimes makes your programs a little hard to debug. But uh, the overall goal is to make things run fast. But the results of the processing can be made deterministic unless you tell the system, this stuff is just unordered. Do whatever the heck you want. Give me the results in any order you feel like, which will often make your program run faster. But you may get results that are somewhat mysterious and incomprehensible. Um, so you can often control the order of the results. And that's because with a, unless you do something to the contrary, if, unless you explicitly say, this stream is unordered, the results will come back to you in what's called encounter order. So if you have like a, if you use a list as your input, then even though the processing of the chunks of the list may occur in any order, the final results will come back in the resulting list, if you use a list, in the same ordering as what you gave in the original list. That's called encounter order. So there's encounter order, which is sort of the order in which it showed up. And then there's processing order. And the processing order is all over the place. We don't really care. But the encounter order might be important, unless you say otherwise. So you can control it. And that's why I have a little controller here. You can control the way that the result will be processed. When a stream runs sequentially, all of its aggregate operations run in a single thread. And I've been visualizing that like this, right? So we have the little dashed lines around the whole stream. Uh, remember again that the even though it looks as though things are going from left to right, level by level, that's actually not what's happening under the hood, but that's the, that's the illusion that you should maybe think about if you want to kind of get a high level view. But the actual processing typically goes from top to bottom through all the elements in the aggregate operation. In any case, when we run the stream in parallel, then the chunks run in multiple threads in the fork join pool. So now we're just drawing little boxes around the chunks that are running in separate threads. And it's up to the streams framework to decide how big those chunks should be. You could control that if you so chose, but, but oftentimes it'll do a good job out of the box. The threads that are in the fork join pool can process these chunks in whatever order they feel like. And of course, the goal of the fork join framework is to make sure that the processing will work efficiently on the underlying processor cores. And, and just to give you an example of this, so it doesn't come across quite abstra as abstract, typically the way things work is that the fork join pool is going to try to maximize affinity as much as possible. So it's going to have a 
queue or decks worth of stuff to do. And we'll see later when we talk about the internals, it's going to put the work in a special order in its deck, puts it in, in FIFO order. So it's first in, first out. So the item that is the first one on the top of the stack, the deck, will be the first one to be popped off to be processed. And the reason for doing that is to just maximize caching, data and instruction caching affinity, all that kind of stuff. So the fork join pool tries to be clever about how it processes stuff. And you shouldn't really care the order in which the processing takes place. The intermediate operations then at a given layer will be run on the uh, run in the threads in which they have been chunked into substrings. So those, that's how the parallelism is going to work. Once the terminal operation is hit, then all the wheels are set into motion, everything gets processed through the intermediate operations, and then the results are finally joined together and combined into a single result. If you use something like collect. Um, if you use for each, then they just run. Um, and there's for each and for each unordered. And for each tries to put it back into encounter order, whereas for each unordered, as the name implies, just runs it in whatever order it processes in. As much as possible, we want to make sure that the lambda or method references that are passed in as the behaviors for each of the aggregate operations within the stream are stateless, because then we can ensure this wonderful, embarrassingly parallel property. And you'll see that when you start writing the code, although it'll be interesting because the programs that you guys are writing now um, don't actually have entirely stateless operations. Why is that? Because they're going to be filtering stuff and writing it to files. And it turns out, of course, that this works out fine for a couple of different reasons, not the least of which is each filtered image goes into a different file. So they're still embarrassingly parallel. But under the hood, the file system access is protected by internal locks in the Java class libraries and lower level parts of the system. So there actually isn't a problem uh, in your program. But the good news is it's still embarrassingly parallel, uh, except for the point where it's getting out of the really low level stuff like the, the I.O. controller on the disk or whatever. And that's managed and locked at a different layer that you don't have to worry about. The same uh, aggregate operations we've talked about so far, so far like for each um, map, flat map, filter, all that stuff, they can be used for both parallel and sequential streams. So everything we've learned already works just fine. Uh, when we take a look at our sequential stream gang, upgrade to the parallel stream gang implementation. You'll see that it's really the same code, it's just that we change stream to parallel stream. Um, so that's, that's a good thing, right? It means that once you've gotten your code to work with sequential streams, often, knock on wood, going to parallel streams is just changing uh, stream to parallel stream. Now, obviously, that little minuscule change will break if you didn't follow the rule about stateless lambdas or if you haven't locked your internal data structures properly. We won't have to worry about that for most of what we're doing, but we'll talk more about what happens if you don't follow those rules later. So the cool part is that the Java 8 streams can really treat parallelism as an optimization and transparently leverage all the available cores. And that's the right way to think about parallel computing. If parallel computing is done properly with the right frameworks, with the right middleware, with the right attention to, to managing complexity, it should just be something that makes stuff run faster. You shouldn't have to start writing new code and re redesigning your software if you've done it right. In contrast, of course, if you program with, with Java threads and, and synchronizers and synchronized statements or synchronized methods or monitor objects or all that good stuff, then going from sequential to parallel is a lot of work. And you have to do major surgery on your code. But if you use this stuff, it should be relatively painless. Anybody know what the? Uh, the reference here is, what have we turned the volume up to? It's, to? it's to 11. Anybody know what that reference is? Spinal Tap, exactly. Very good. 10 points to Peyton. Naturally, the behaviors that are run must not have race conditions, right? If, if that's not the case, then all hell will break, break loose. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how a parallel stream works. And this is one of my favorite examples. I spent quite a long time drawing this, so I'm very proud of it, as you can tell. So basically, a, a parallel stream 
is essentially a variant of the famous MapReduce model that's optimized for multi-core processors. If you Google you know, MapReduce, or if you go look at the Wikipedia link for MapReduce, it'll talk about some of the things I'm about to mention. But the canonical examples of MapReduce are really typically cluster computing like you would use for a Google search, right? Where they take your search query and they break it up over many machines which have their own copies of all the information in the web, and they each search for different things, and then they join all the results back together. They, they reduce. So this particular variant that Java provides is not for clusters, it's for a multi-core processor. So just remember that. It's not trying to solve the problem that, say, Hadoop is trying to solve. It's solving a piece of that. It's still a good, good piece to solve, but it's not solving the whole thing. So what it does is it starts uh, with the original data, the things you want to work on, like let's say we have a fridge full of food, and then it goes ahead and it partitions it up into chunks. So we have you know, a loaf of bread, a uh, head of lettuce, I don't know what you call ham, a block of ham, a block of cheese, a tomato, and so on. And then in the map phase, there's some transformation that's being done. So we might you know, slice the bread or slice the lettuce or slice the cheese, et cetera. So we end up with a bunch of pieces. And then when we're all finished with all the processing, right? so mapping is a transformation of some sort, we then put everything together and we reduce it into our final result. So whenever anybody asks you, what is MapReduce, just think about, you know, like Subway, sandwich shop, making sandwiches, right? That, that's sort of a MapReduce model uh, where they're taking the supplies and they're breaking them up and they're transforming them and then you're putting it back together again to the final result. So that's what people sometimes say. The, the actual model, the MapReduce isn't really quite the right phrase. A better phrase is split, apply, combine, which oddly enough never caught on. Maybe it's just too, uh, maybe it's just too, verbose, like MapReduce is a little short, but they could have called it you know, the SAC model or something. And if you take a look at this link, you'll read an article about split, apply, combine, but that's really what Java 8 is doing. And the way it does it, of course, is it uses the classic fork join pool and some other stuff in order to enable all this. So we have the split phase, which is involved in recursively partitioning the data source into independent chunks. I was making a pizza for my son and some of his friends this weekend. And when I was done, I was like, you know, thinking about this slide with my pizza cutter, I was slicing it up into chunks, right? So that's the split phase. It's basically divide and conquer. It uses splitterators to do this. We talked about splitterators. You'll, you've got a chance to play around with splitterators. You'll see now in the assignment 2A and 2B why you did that, because splitterators provide the means for partitioning your array up into chunks that can be run either sequentially or in parallel. You can define your own custom splitterators, which you've done. There's other examples here. And as a general rule of thumb, which we'll talk about more later, things work a lot better if you can split your input evenly and quickly. If you can't split it evenly or you can't split it quickly, then that's when the overhead of parallel streams becomes an issue. But if you can, then life is good. Yeah, Matt. Oh, great question. So the question is, if you, even if you don't split things per perfectly evenly, will your work stealing algorithm still save you? To some extent. Um, but what you'll see is if your work stealing algorithm really likes it when you're able to break your original input up into chunks using log n steps, because you have a nice, beautiful tree of chunks that are that nice, nice and balanced. And then, you know, there's, let's, let's say you had a thousand elements to start with and you broke it up into chunks. So you end up with log n chunks if it can all divide up evenly. Um, and so then those chunks can be processed really fast. If you do end up with linear chunks, you know, <laughs> if each thing is one item followed by all the rest, and then the next item followed by all the rest, and then the next item, you'll, you'll have basically a, a linked list of stuff. And so you'll have a lot more things for the work stealing algorithm to have to process. So the Creating of the chunks in the first place will take longer, and you'll just have a lot more to process. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, the thing to remember is that parallel computing works best when you can give the core something to work on, and it can work for a little bit of time, a fairly long amount of time. You know, 
because there is some work in getting it work to do. And once it's got the work, you want it to chunk. Um, you want it to work on a big enough chunk to make it worthwhile running in parallel. If you give each, if each thing that's in the, the work items in a queue is, is just one item long, you'll pull the thing off, you'll do the work, and then you'll just immediately have to go back and get the next one. And so you'll spend a lot of time just waiting for something to do. So as, as a rule of thumb, it's, it's better to try to give chunks that are a little bigger, so then there are fewer of them. That'll work better. That's a really good question. Um, the next thing, so that was split, apply, you process the chunks in the pool of threads. And the way that this works under the hood, this is sort of an implementation detail, but it's worth noting. The way that the fork, the way that the streams splitting process works is it doesn't do all the splitting followed by all the applying. It does a little splitting and then it starts feeding the splits into the cores to run. And that's, that's intentional. We don't want to have to wait. You don't want the cores just sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for the perfect split. You want the stuff to start getting that work out as quickly as possible. So after a certain number of things are ready to go, then they're given out and things can run in parallel. So typically splitting is done in one thread, or one core, but then the chunks would run in other cores. So after you've got a, you know, a, um, if you've got critical mass of work to work on, then things start to run. Programmers have some control about how many threads there are in the pool, and, and you'll get a chance to play around with that also in the next programming assignment. I'll let you play around with that. Um, Java Parallel Streams likes you to use the common fork join pool for a variety of reasons we'll talk about later, but there's some ways to control the pool in some extent. So you, it's kind of like a control system. You have some opportunities to to influence the number of threads and the way that the threads are created and the way that they go away. And then the final result is to combine things together and that's the joining phase. And of course that's done by these reduction operations like collect and reduce. So the terminal operations are the ones that often are used to, to combine stuff together. Okay, so that's basically the end of the intro.